Welcome to Music History Monday for April 25th, 2022. I'm Bob Greenberg, and the title for today's podcast is Puccini's Turandot, an opera that almost wasn't. If you haven't already, please consider joining me on my subscription site at patreon.com slash robertgreenbergmusic, where I blog, vlog, podcast, pontificate, review, and bloviate four to six times a week. We mark the premiere performance on April 25th, 1926, 96 years ago today, of Giacomo Puccini's 12th and final opera, Turandot. The premiere took place at Milan's storied La Scala Opera House and was conducted by Puccini's friend and occasional nemesis, Arturo Toscanini, 1867 to 1957. At the time of the premiere, Puccini himself had been dead for 17 months, and therein lies our tale. Because given the delays in creating the libretto for Turandot, Puccini's failing health, his leaving the opera incomplete at his death, and the controversy surrounding Turandot's subsequent completion by the composer Franco Alfano, 1875 to 1954, it was indeed an opera that almost didn't happen. Giacomo Puccini was born in the Tuscan city of Lucca on December 22, 1858, and died in Brussels, Belgium on November 29th, 1924, three weeks shy of his 66th birthday. Puccini's operas remain among the most popular in the repertoire, but among the most critically controversial as well. It is a controversy we will not discuss in this post. Rather, I would direct you to Music History Monday for January 14th, 2019. That post on Puccini's opera Tosca, wades chin-deep into the critical issues that continue to dog his work. Sometime in early March 1920, Puccini was having lunch in Milan with the librettists Giuseppe Adami, 1878 to 1946, and Renato Simoni, 1875 to 1952. Discussing stories that could be turned into operas, Simone brought up the name of the Venetian playwright Carlo Gozzi, 1720-1806, and suggested they look over his works. Puccini, who knew something of Gozzi's theatrical fables, asked, What about Turandot? What about it indeed? It was a well-known story. The German poet and playwright Friedrich Schiller, 1759-1805, had translated it and staged it in German in 1801, and it had been the subject of an opera composed in 1854 by Puccini's teacher, Antonio Bazzani. Simone had a copy of the play in his nearby apartment. He ran home, retrieved it, and gave it to Puccini to read. Having read, and we expect reread, the play, Puccini wrote Simone a few days later, instructing Simone and Adami to prepare a libretto about the haughty Chinese princess Turandot, emphasizing, according to Puccini, quote, the amorous passions of Turandot, who has suffered for such a long time under the ashes of her great pride, unquote. And then? And then Puccini's waiting began. Spring turned to summer, summer to fall. In October of 1920, a clearly frustrated Puccini wrote to his friend Sybil Seligman in London, quote, I'm not yet working on Turandot because they haven't given me the libretto yet. And if they wait much longer, I shall have to get them to put pen, paper, and ink pot in my tomb. What a cheerful idea, but that's how I feel, just like that." Unquote. By December, 
Puccini's frustration had turned to genuine worry. He wrote Simone, quote, My anxiety, I would almost say suffering, over idleness and my frenzy to be working, that is for the tyrannical princess, are growing day by day. I think that it was August when you described the scenario to me. Twenty days from now, it will be Christmas. I am not criticizing you, but if my words had spear points, you, you pure-blood thoroughbred, would think someone was driving spurs into your flanks. Don't be angry with me. People tell me that when you talk about my impatience, sparks fly from your eyes. If you only knew that every day I jot down themes and conceive processions, I whisper hidden choruses, I invent unearthly harmonies. But for heaven's sake, hurry, both of you hurry. I would like all the work to be finished, tight, balanced, fine, and polished." Unquote. Povero, meaning poor Giacomo. Instead of a finished, tight, balanced, fine, and polished libretto, he began receiving dribs and drabs the following month, in January of 1921. Puccini did not complete Act I until November of 1922, by which point he had finally received revised drafts of the second and third acts of the libretto from Simone and Adami. But when Puccini finally got to work on the third act in January of 1923, he discovered, to no small horror, that the libretto for that act was still, for him, unworkable. In a letter verging on hysteria, he wrote Adami, quote, It is quite impossible. Perhaps, and maybe there is no perhaps, I too am no longer possible. But about this Act Three, there is no doubt at all. I am not quite at the stage of crying. I die despairingly, but very nearly. Can you make something out of it with the help of the old Act Three? Is it possible? And shall I be able to do my part? I am very, very much afraid. I am a poor, unhappy man, discouraged, old, abject, nothing. What am I to do? I don't know. I'll go to bed and sleep to escape the torture of thinking." Unquote. Ominous Tidings While attempting to finish Act Two later that year, 1923, Puccini came down with a sore throat and a persistent cough. This had happened before. He had been a heavy smoker his entire life and was accustomed to throat discomfort and coughing. But by February of 1924, Puccini's throat pain had become acute. He was exhausted, and with his doctors prescribing rest, Puccini's work on Turandot ground to a halt. Meanwhile, revisions to the libretto of the Act Three finale were still dribbling in eight months later, in October of 1924, by which time they were far too late. Incapacitated with pain, a cancerous tumor was finally discovered in Puccini's throat under his epiglottis. This laryngeal cancer was terminal, though that information was kept from Puccini and his wife Elvira, though Puccini's son Tonio was fully informed. The terminal nature of Puccini's cancer did not keep his doctors from attempting to treat it. Venturing to a specialist named Dr. Louis Ladoux in Brussels, Belgium, Puccini was given what was then experimental radiation treatment on November 24, 1924. A tracheotomy was first performed and a breathing tube was inserted. Then seven radioactive crystal needles were inserted into the tumor. The operation lasted three and a half hours, during which Puccini was conscious the entire time. He had been given only a local anesthesia, quote, so as not to overtax his heart, unquote. Following the operation, he scribbled on a pad, I feel as though I have bayonets in my throat. They have massacred me, unquote. 
Yeah, that sounds just about right. The radioactive needles still in his throat. He went into cardiac arrest and died five days later on November 29th at 1130 in the morning. An unfinished opera. Of one thing, we can be certain. Had Puccini received a finished libretto in an even remotely timely manner, Turandot would have been completed long before he took ill. But it was not completed, and too much was riding on it, artistically and financially, to leave it incomplete. The premiere, which had been scheduled by La Scala for April 1925, was pushed back a year. Arturo Toscanini, who had followed the composition of Turandot closely and who was to conduct its premiere, was assigned the job of choosing the composer who would complete the opera. Toscanini chose the opera composer Riccardo Zandoni, 1883 to 1944. Zandoni was a fine choice, but he was nixed by Puccini's son Tonio, who claimed that Zandoni was already too famous in his own right. Pietro Mascani, no unknown either, was suggested, as was the Rome-based opera composer Vincenzo Tomasini. Puccini's publisher, the House of Ricordi, suggested the highly respected Naples-based opera composer Franco Alfano, a candidate who was endorsed by both Toscanini and Tonio Puccini. We can only wish that Toscanini had left Franco Alfano alone to do the job for which he had been hired. With poor Puccini dead, Toscanini decided that it was he, Arturo Toscanini, maestro of La Scala, who would decide how Turandot was to end. Toscanini told Alfano to expand the finale far past what Puccini had planned. This Alfano did. But when, after six months of intense work, it's not easy to convincingly impersonate the work of a recently deceased and beloved composer, Alfano presented the finale to Toscanini. The conductor rejected it, claiming that it was too long. Toscanini ordered Alfano to now shorten the finale, which was done. For our information, the first longer version of the finale is today referred to as Alfano I, the second version as Alfano II. At the final dress rehearsal, Alfano approached Toscanini and asked him, quote, what do you have to say, maestro? Unquote. With singular disrespect, Toscanini replied, quote, I say that I saw Puccini approaching me from the rear of the stage to clout me, unquote. At the premiere performance on April 25th, 1926, 96 years ago today, Toscanini famously stopped the performance during the third act. Putting down his baton, he turned to the audience and said, quote, here the opera ends because at this point the maestro died. Unquote. As the opera historian Charles Osborne observes, quote, thus, the famous laying down of the baton at the point at which Puccini finished writing may have been, on Toscanini's part, an act not only of piety towards Puccini, but of vindictiveness towards Alfano. Unquote. For our information, the subsequent performances of that first La Scala run employed Alfano II, but with roughly three minutes cut from it. Turandot today. Franco Alfano's efforts notwithstanding, today there is no single definitive conclusion to Turandot. On rare occasion, it is Alfano I. Sometimes it is Alfano II. Ricordi published both versions. Sometimes the Alfano endings are performed, but with cuts. Over the years, other composers have tried their hands at completing Turandot, with varying degrees of success, or might we more accurately say, with varying degrees of unsuccess. 
Those who have composed endings for Turandot include the American conductor and composer, and for five years, the director of the Spoleto Festival, Stephen Mercurio, born 1956. The famed Italian composer, Luciano Berrio, 1925 to 2003. The American composer, Janet McGuire, 1927 to 2019. And the Chinese composer, Hao Waiya. Heck, maybe I'll give it a shot. Postscript. Despite the fact that he could be a tremendous jerk, here's why we can never hate Arturo Toscanini. The premiere of Turandot on April 25, 1926, corresponded with a visit to Milan from the fascist dictator Benito Mussolini, who was in town in connection with the fascist party's Empire Day celebration, a holiday he had invented. The management of La Scala knew an easy PR opportunity when they saw one and invited Mussolini to attend the premier performance of Turandot as its special guest. Mussolini was all too happy to attend, though on the condition that the fascist anthem called Giovanezza be performed before the beginning of the opera. When he was informed of this proviso, the famously anti-fascist Arturo Toscanini blew his stack and told the La Scala management that if they wanted the anthem, they'd have to find themselves another conductor. When Il Duce, meaning Mussolini, was informed that no anthem would be played, he chose to absent himself and his entourage from the premiere. And good riddance to bad rubbish, we rightly proclaim. Thank you. To sample and download one or all of my many courses on subjects musical produced by The Great Courses slash The Teaching Company, please visit my website at robertgreenbergmusic.com.